together was blessed by a pastor friend who posted this this morning great quote great reminder preparation for our communion Sunday the first Sunday of this new year in the Lord amen, amen. pray we're excited but this old saint said this brethren we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God won't you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Great thought, amen? Lord, so prepare our hearts right now. We thank you that we get to freely and boldly come and we profess the work of Christ as our confidence. But Lord, nothing could, nothing can, nothing should keep us away from coming into your presence as we look at the cross, as we remember that the price is, is paid, as we silence the voices, Lord, that detract from you, that distract us. And we come because we know your word is truth. You love us, Lord. You're so glad that we're here and you're going to bless those who come. So prepare us, God. Prepare us so we can bless you with a sacrifice of praise, God, with the fruit of our lives and not just our lips, our tithes and offerings, Lord, but also to celebrate communion, to remember Jesus Christ, to proclaim what he's done until he comes for us. And we pray that's today, Lord. We, we hope and trust that it's this year, the year of our Lord. Prepare us, Lord, to bless you right now. Lord, would your spirit lead our worship? Would you prepare our hearts for your word? In all things, we pray that Jesus is glorified. Give us strength where we need it. Enable us, Lord, in our weakness and help us to make 
a joyful noise, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Just thank the Lord, church. Worship Him. Thank Him right now for His goodness and His mercy. It's new every morning. It's fresh for 2015. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He became sin. He knew no sin that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Sing it out. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. For sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken in Redeemer, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Sing it out. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All glory to you, God. The light of the world. Jesus Messiah. Give him a big hand, a hallelujah. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Amen.
sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Lord Jesus. We give you praise, God. We give you glory. Lord, as we give to you our tithes and offerings today, we make it a part of our worship because, God, we know that that's what it is. And so receive, Lord, uh, our livelihood as we give joyfully to you today. And if we can't give joyfully, Lord, help us to know that we shouldn't give it all. Lord, not begrudgingly. That's not how you give us opportunity to give. You love a cheerful giver, so bring cheer to our hearts. You will bring cheer to our lives as we honor you. So help us to give with joy today, God. You may be seated, church.
Thank you, Father, that part of what worship means is to yield ourselves to you. It's the ultimate expression of affection, but it's also the surest sign of a yielded life. Worship that flows from the heart that just says, I'm yours, God. Take me and do something with me. Or we thank you that for those praying that prayer today, making that profession, you will, Lord. You'll take us, and we don't need to wonder what you'll do. But by the power of your Spirit, you'll make us more like Jesus. You'll combine divine character, Lord, somehow with who I am and how you've made me to be. And it's a beautiful thing. Lord, if we glory, help us today to glory in the Lord. To place the cross, Lord, at the forefront of our minds, Lord, that every decision we would make, Lord, every thought that precedes action would be focused by that cross. No one takes my life from me, you said Jesus, but I lay it down willingly. And so too, that's what you've called us to do. That's our desire, Lord, to take up our cross and follow after you to be a servant of the Most High God. Center our lives, Lord, on the cross again this morning. It symbolizes not just what you've done, but who we're to be in light of what you've done. So set me straight today. Refocus us this morning in light of your sacrifice, Jesus, who you are, what you've done, all that that means that we've got a relationship, fellowship with the Father. An amazing family kind of connection with one another and, Lord, a heart for those who are lost and not yet a part of your family, your kingdom, who are outside, Lord. We want them inside. So refocus us today, we pray. Bless us, Lord, as we remember who you are, what you've done. Help us as you instructed us to, to receive in a worthy way this morning, to esteem all worth to the person of Jesus Christ and what he's done and not our works. Thank you, Lord. The ushers are going to pass out the elements. Hold on to them if you would as we worship for a bit. Give the Holy Spirit opportunity to speak into our lives. We'll receive together. Just a moment. Blood of Christ we boldly come 
Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the cross. There's no other like you. Nothing compares to your grace. the blood of Christ we boldly come as your word so instructs us Father we enter in with thanksgiving to these courts with praise and with a grateful heart and spirit exalting the name of Jesus because he's our everything would you capture our hearts Lord on this first Sunday of this fresh new year Capture our hearts by your love and develop in us a radical, increased love for Jesus. 
that our lives can reflect, Lord, through obedience, that radical love. We just won't care, Lord, what others think or the world says. We will worship you, Lord. We will exalt you. Here in the sanctuary, God, in the workplace, Lord, our neighborhoods, God, with our family members, with whom it's so tough sometimes. But we're going to let our love out, God. Capture our hearts through communion today, we pray. You're not ashamed of us, Lord. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. Capture our hearts with your love. We're asking you right now so that you can capture our time, our talents, our treasures, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for being the captain of our salvation, the Alpha, the Omega the beginning, the end, and everything in between, Lord, loving us as you do. Let's partake of the bread and the cup.
sing and sing it. and is and is to come worthy 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 is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world for our sin we love you Jesus and we thank you so much for sharing a Sunday with us we rejoice God in the reminder that you want to spend every day with us Lord enjoying us as we enjoy you God, let that fellowship, Lord, be seen by others. Would we be invitational, God, in regard to it? Open enough to talk about it, Lord, that others might find it too. No other like you, Jesus. And we want the world to know. Work in us today. Would your word work in us today? And it will, Lord, to that end. We thank you, God, we love you. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, we say, amen. amen. As the lights come on, take a minute, turn around, greet one another, especially if there's someone you don't recognize. Find them, say hello.
his hair like he's never has before and he's changing his dress and his looks and everything else. I don't know what it is, but I, I assume that he is being captivated by some young girl. And uh, He's only 17 and he's thinking about marrying her. It's amazing. He's so smitten by her. She has stole his heart. I try to forewarn him saying, you know what, just go slow. Um, don't let your emotions get ahead of you. And realize, you know, this can go the other direction. Do you remember when you were first captivated by the woman or the man you're sitting by today? Too hard, to, probably hard to remember, right? <laughs> But there was a time where we were just so captivated by someone and we hoped that they would be captivated by us. We were enraptured by their presence and we would hope that they would reciprocate and love us back. There was an old French game. Its origin was in France. It goes like this. He loves me, he loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. They would take a petal, maybe a daisy, a flower, and in essence, what they would really do is that they would pull a petal, he loves me, he loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not, and they would get down to the last petal. And that was the defining confirmation whether if you were loved or not. And you didn't want to get to the end of that and find out she loves me not, or he loves me not. You know God is so captivated by you. Did you know that? I often tell you he has your picture on his refrigerator. He is so enthralled with you. You are the apple of his eye. You're that special to God and his desires for you to be captivated by him also. So as we begin the new year, one of the things that I desire in my own life is just saying, God, I really want you to be the center of my life again. I want to be captivated by you. I want a greater awareness of you in my life. I so want that. A greater sense of his presence. <laughs> There's just something about being married for 41 years. I mean, it is fantastic, but, but there's times where it just gets a little mundane, a little boring. You wake up to the same person, bad breath and all, and you go to bed with the same person. You wake up, it's, it's like the sun. You get bored with the sun. It rises in the east and sets in the west. It's like life, and that's where Ecclesiastes talks about, you know, is, is there anything more than life than just the sun rising and setting every day? And sometimes it's that way. But when I first met Char, wow, I was just so overwhelmed. Talking about someone whose life was stolen from him. She stole everything from me. Everything from me. I was emotionally attached to that woman and I didn't know if she really liked me. I was living with a, another brother in Christ and back then we had shag hairs and for whatever reason, because I had a shag haircut and he did and we lived together, Char felt like maybe I wasn't interested in women. So she would just ignore me. And then one day, Someone convinced her that it was just a style, it wasn't my lifestyle, it was just the style of hair that I chose back then. Oh, did I wish, do I wish I had that hair today? Nice and thick, and, oh yeah, you know, and, you know. And she asked me out, invited me over to her house and cooked me one hot dog and we had lunch together. I, I underscore one hot dog because back then I can eat ten. But anyhow, I was just so thrilled just having one because I was basking in her presence. I remember when I first came to Christ, I was so captivated by my Savior. I mean, he paid it all to capture my heart. and I just remembered, I, I was just so drunk on God, if I could say that. I mean, I, I was just beside myself. In fact, one day I was coming home from church, and uh, I got pulled over by the police. and. They came to the window and I was pretty smart. He asked if I was drinking. I said, no, I wasn't drinking wine, but I was drinking the new wine of the Holy Spirit. He said, get out of the car, you know. <laughs> Honestly, there are two of them there. I had to put my hands on top of the car. They frisked me. They asked me to walk a straight line. And, you know, I mean, that's how intoxicated I was with God. It was overwhelming. And it lasted for a period of time, and then it began to wane. And I realized what God was saying, you can't live in the state forever. you you got to go to work, you know. And I feel that way at times with Char. You know, we've had a wonderful life. I wouldn't want to change my life or anything with Char. But there's times where you just hit a bump in the road, or you just take each other for granted. 
you just seem to ignore each other. The next thing you know, it's, you're not as close as you once were. You, you know how marriage is. You know how relationships are. I always tell you that marriages are a living organism. They need to be fed. They need to be nurtured. When they're not fed or nurtured with love and affection and appreciation and gratitude, they tend to die. Well, that's happened in my life a few times. I've never told her, and so don't tell her. But I thought about leaving her a few times. She's not here, so don't tell her next week, all right? All right? And I'm sure she probably thought that about a hundred times with me. But we, we made a vow. We made a commitment. It wasn't based on feelings. It was based on more than that. It was based on our character. That we chose to make a vow based, again, on an absolute trust in each other that we would stay the course no matter what, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and health. And I'm so thankful we did. But here's the thing that really helped us. I realize that you fall in love and you fall out of love. It's an emotional thing at times. We know that from God's perspective, love is more than just a verb, it's an action. It's something that we do, that we give our life entirely to the other person for their good and for their benefit. But sometimes we fall in love and we fall out of love. And I was always taught if you fall out of love, you go back and do the very acts of what you did when you first fell in love. And we decided to do that. So we began to revisit the restaurants that we used to hang out at. We began to revisit the places that we used to have fun together with, at times with. We just begin to revisit those places and we begin to do the things that we used to do, those acts of love. And once we begin to do the acts of love, the feelings begin to come back again. And next thing you know, we're in love again for another 20 years, 30 years, however that is. Maybe that's the same way spiritually. Maybe there's times where we can fall out of love, or at least maybe are indifferent toward God and to His wooing. God always loves us. And we love Him, but maybe because because the world that we live in today, and because things get just get so busy, sometimes uh, we don't have time to pay attention to Him. There was times I was so inattentive to Shar. She would speak to me, and I would fall asleep every time. I used to think to myself, if I want to fall asleep, I'll just let Shar talk to me. And, and inevitably, she would start talking. You know, she'd wake me. I'm sorry, honey, but you know, it worked that way. Or when she was talking to me, I was always reading a book. It was a godly book. It was a good book. It was a spiritual book. I thought I had justification to ignore her. And finally, you know, uh, after sleeping on the couch for a week, you know, when she locked the bedroom door, just kidding, just kidding, I realized I needed to be more attentive. The psalmist said, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Not my salvation. He was speaking to God. God, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. It's your salvation that's been given to me. And let me find joy in that again. Let me be recaptured by you again. Let me be captivated by you who is captivated by my presence. And I, I just want to talk about that today because I think this is a new year. And what do we want in a new year? What are we anticipating in 2015? 14's behind us. This is a new day, new beginning. What do we want to do? What do we want to have in God? A greater awareness of Jesus in our life. For me, a greater sense of his presence. I want to look at an old story. It's found in Luke chapter 2. This is probably a month or two after the birth of Jesus. So it fits so well into this New Year story, if you would. The Holy Family finds themselves in Jerusalem. They make the trek, not a long trek, from Bethlehem where Jesus was born. He was circumcised on the eighth day and now he's, be, he's, he's becoming to be, excuse me, he's being present to the Lord, being presented to the Lord, and dedicated to the Lord as the law required that. The young family here is fulfilling the requirement of Jesus, Jesus uh, excuse me, of Jewish law, I can't ever talk today, Jewish law. They present Jesus to the Lord as the Father presents Jesus to the world. I really love that. Pastor Aaron in the first service talked about during communion time, may we just be more attentive to God's presence. And then the second time he talked about, again, celebrating and really being captivated by God. I think we all need Jesus' presence more in our lives. Those God moments, you know those God moments that you used to have? You know those heightened awarenesses of, of God's presence in your life? You just you sense God's presence. Maybe it's in church, maybe it's in prayer, maybe it's in worship. You know, maybe it's by a lakeside. You know, maybe it's running, maybe it's riding your bike. Whatever it is, you just, all of a sudden you're just so cognizant that this is a God moment. 
that God is here. I sense him in a way that I've never sensed him before. It's an invigorating experience that you have with God. It's, it's a few things, a few times you have in your life, but they're so important. It boosts your spirituality. You end up getting these God bumps when you're so captivated by God. So let's read this story together. In Jerusalem lived a man named Simeon who was a good man and godly. You could tell from just this first verse that he loved the Lord. He was a religious man, devout man to the things of God. And notice this, he was waiting for the time when God would take away Israel's sorrow and the Holy Spirit was in him. A time of waiting, a time of anticipating. Again, remember, Israel was occupied by the Romans. They were suppressed. They had to pay taxes to their enemies. And they're waiting. They're waiting for their Messiah to come, to deliver them and set them free. They didn't understand the whole implications of his coming. In fact, they got probably most of it wrong. But he is waiting for the time when God will take away Israel's sorrow. And Simeon had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Christ promised by the Lord. Now just a side note, I shared it in the first service. Somebody once helped me with this. You know, if you have an issue, always think you're going to die. You know, this is the big one. You know, uh, this is it. I got cancer, I'm dying. You know, get a promise from God. Ask God for a promise. And to realize that that will never happen until God first restores or fulfills that promise. And here we see it here. He had a promise from the Lord that he would not die till he saw the Christ. He was living free. He wasn't worrying about every cough that he had or every time he sneezed or hung around people who had some deadly disease. Why? He had a promise from God. He was sure in that. The psalmist says, Remember thy word that you've given unto your servant, for this is my hope in my time of my affliction. God, remember that promise. Remember that word you gave me. This, this is my hope. It, it keeps me going. Get a word from God for your life. Rest in that. Believe in that. And you'll live more peacefully. and You'll sleep well at night. And the Spirit led Simeon to the temple. When Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple to do what the law said they must, Simeon took the baby in his arms. Oh, I love that. Do you remember when the first time you held your child? Ah. I called my dad and I said, Dad, I have a son. And you have a grandson. My whole life changed when that baby was placed in my arms. My life changed when I embraced Christ. I'm no longer the same person. Forty-some-odd years now, I sense his arms around me, and I hope that he senses my arms around him. It was such a fulfilling moment. Notice verse 29. Now, Lord, you can let me, your servant, die in peace. Wow. The sting of death is gone. The terror of death is no longer lingering over his head. He's at peace. Why? Because he's embraced the Savior. Many of you know that I deal with the sick and dying on a regular basis. And I was with a dying patient the other day who happened to be a dear friend of mine. I was there the day before he passed away and we were just fellowshipping you know, about our lives and the goodness of God. And He just said, George, I am so ready to go to meet Jesus. He's bright, he was cognizant, he was articulate. You know, he wasn't seeming to be fighting any pain or, or whatever it might be, any side effects of the medication. He was just so clear. He said, I'm just longing to be with Jesus. And he Lord, that is so incredible. Like Simeon, he put his arms around Christ and he says, Lord, I am ready to die. And the next day he passed away. Verse 30, with my own eyes, my own eyes, not that of my parents or my pastor or my friends, but with my own eyes. Not that of my wife or my husband or my dad or my grandpa. Of my own eyes, I have seen your salvation. It's been said that God doesn't have any grandkids. He only has children. You know, we don't enter the kingdom of God on the coattail of our parents. 
or grandparents or whatever it might is. We enter into that relationship as an individual personally. It's when we finally see Jesus for who he really is. One to deliver us as we saw here from the enemy who has captivated us and captured us and imprisoned us in a life of sin and destruction. Something happens when you set your eyes on Christ and he becomes real in your life. You are so free. You're more freer than you've ever been in your life. I'm free. I'm free. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God I'm free at last. Twenty-one years old, doing psychedelics and doing weed and hashish and all that stuff, hash. And everybody started graduating into heroin. And I didn't want to go there. I, I just did not want to be a junkie. And God came into my life at that right time, at that right moment, and set me free from that lifestyle. Really free at last. Simeon had seen with his own eyes of faith before that Christ was going to come, but now he was able to behold him with his own eyes. He lived with a high expectation. He was serving the Most High God who gave him a great promise. And he knew that. And I love when he takes the baby in his arms. The first thing he does, he thanks God. He takes the baby out of the arms of Mary and braces it for himself with such affection, such respect for this newborn king. Bless God for making his good promise a reality to him. He praises God, gives glory to God here it says, for God's goodness, sending the promised Messiah, the long-wished Savior, the Christ child who enters Mary's womb now enters Simeon's heart. I love this portion of scripture. Holding Jesus gave him peace in the sense of the favor of God. You don't want to die without embracing Jesus. And if you're here and you don't know this wonderful Savior, I really hope that you'll get to know him. You know, never be forced on you. He doesn't work that way. He doesn't try to coerce you into believing. He doesn't use gimmicks to draw you to himself. He uses a cross. That's what he used. The love of the cross. He didn't use force at the cross. He could have easily come down. He easily could have called thousands of angels to come to his rescue, but he stayed there because of love's sake. He would not force himself. That's not his style. In fact, he wants you to delight in him and be captivated by him and captured by his grace. Because if you're not, he knows that it won't last. Maybe you've been dragged here today. Maybe you've been kicking and screaming, uh, coming. You didn't want to come, but you're here. And, you know, the reality is that you find yourself as the offering plate goes by and you think, oh man, I'm not going to give. And the reality, you don't have to give. But let me share something with you in the New Testament. Paul says you never are forced to give. You never do it out of a grumbling heart. Because God loves a what? God loves a cheerful giver. That's the relationship that God has with you. You know, for me to feel that Char's just putting up with me because of a vow. That she really despises every moment that she spends with me. She loathes me. She just loathes me, but she'll put up with me because of the vow. What would that do to me? What would it do to you if you know that your mate is just putting up with you? You know, God is a good God. And we need to bring him out of that bad God scene scenario that everybody's painted God into. Get him out of that and let people know, no, he's a good God. And he wants you to enjoy him. To enjoy him. The old catechism says, what is the duty of man but to serve God and enjoy him forever? And maybe you're at a place, like it is in any relationship, where you've lost the joy. I want to try to help you to get it back. Is that all right? Because I know you're here today because you want that. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to find that joy or you don't have that joy of the Lord. What is the one thing you look forward to with anticipation in 2015? Well, I think God has a desire for all of us is to know Him from the least to the greatest. That's the new covenant. The Bible tells us the new covenant is not written on tablets of stone but on the tablets of our own heart. 
where he says that your sins and your iniquity I will remember no more. But he also goes on to say, and everyone will know me from the least to the greatest. He's not forced on anyone. But like Simeon, they come to the place that they behold him and reach out to him and embrace him. And their lives radically change. I used to force people into conversions. It didn't last long. Oh, I had another notch on my belt. The evangelist George got another one. It didn't last long. Because forced conversions were never produced out of love. To know Him. To be satisfied with Him. Because when we know Him, He satisfies every need in our life. Emotionally. Particularly emotionally and spiritually and mentally. To experience the joy of the Lord, the satisfaction of knowing God is so life-changing. And He experienced the perfect love of Jesus here in this text. This reality of this deep, deep moment with God. I, I just love it as I look at that. Before he was a devoted man, but now he's one that is meeting with the divine encounter here. He had religion without the reality of Christ. He knew the facts of religion, but he never saw the face of religion. He saw Christ for the first time. Going back to my relationship with my wife when I first saw her, I thought she was pretty hot. Long, frizzy hair, hair underneath her arms, all over her legs. Yeah, she was pretty hot. She was a hippie at that time. But there was something about her, but something happened one day that really convinced me that I want to spend the rest of my life with her. We were in San Francisco. Took her there and we went to lunch, a little pizza parlor there. And I looked in her eyes for the first time. And I was smitten. I can't help but think of Simeon holding that baby and looking in the eyes of innocence. The eyes of perfect love. The eyes of grace and compassion. I can't imagine what it must have been like to look in the eyes of Jesus. It changed him forever. And I think Jesus wants us to look into his eyes again afresh and to realize that he is altogether lovely, so loving, so gracious, so forgiving. We took communion again today. Remember we did that Christmas Eve and I told you when you taste of the bread, you're tasting the love of God and when you drink of the communion, you're tasting the love of forgiveness. Remember that for some of you? I don't want you ever to think about communion any differently, but that you're tasting the love of God and tasting His forgiveness. Is there anything greater than that? Because even in my best day, I always blow it. I mean, I tell you, even my best day when I think, man, I finally overcame that, I realize there's still other things in my life. I always need to surround myself with this love and this forgiveness that I find from my Savior. I want you to realize that he encountered Christ for the first time. And then he embraced Christ. Then he also embodied Christ because he took Christ to his mom, Jesus' mom and dad, and began to speak prophetically into their lives. And it's something when we encounter Christ, and then when we begin to embrace Christ as our own. There's a lot of people who encounter Christ, but they won't embrace him. But once they embrace him, they become embodied by him. Then they begin to take them to their friends and their families and share the love of God with them. We see him believing in Christ here. We see him beholding Christ here. And we see him blessing others in Christ. He blessed Mary and Joseph. That's what happens when we're captivated. When I finally realized that I want to spend the rest of my life with Char, we decided to get married. We put invitations out. We sent them out. We had hundreds of people at our wedding. Why? Because we wanted to share our bliss and our joy. Remember that time when God so got a hold of your life and you looked in Jesus' eyes and you thought, oh, this is incredible. All my sins are forgiven. I'm loved. I've got a place in eternity with God. I don't have to worry about death any longer. You know, we just tell everybody, everybody. But when you're going through a divorce or a strain in your relationship, you don't want to tell anybody about your marriage. 
I think same way spiritually, sometimes we can find ourselves where, where we just wonder, what's it all about Alfie? You know? Simeon felt loved. He felt free here. He felt peace. He felt so much joy. What a feeling. And we need to seize those divine moments that God gives us like that. Because I've had them and I want more of them. How about you? Of course we do. Come on, God. Give us those, those moments. We were just so aware of your presence. Consumed by your love. God, we, we just need those moments. Moments when we become more intimate with you. That you're just so close to us. It's almost like we can see you and, and touch you. Those moments of his presence that overwhelm us. God wants us all to find him in all of life and have those moments. That's true spiritual living. And what is true spiritual living? It's knowing God intimately and personally. Not a form of religion, not a tradition, not a ritual, but a person. So many people know their theology. They know about the second coming. They know about missions. They know about, you know, the atonement. They know about that, but they don't know Jesus intimately. So many people go to church regularly. They worship regularly, but never have a close encounter with Christ. And I think that just breaks God's heart. You know they say that most marriages in the United States are sexless relationships or sexless marriage. And I need to be careful here, but what it's saying is that there's no longer any intimacy. Whatever form of intimacy, there's not. They, 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 just, they just congregate together. They just hang out together. They just exist together. But there's no intimacy. And I'm thinking, the Bible says it's what's first is natural, then what's is spiritual. We look at natural things and we can apply spiritual truths to them. That's what Jesus did with the parables. They were just natural stories that had deeper revelation regarding their relationship with God, the kingdom of God. He uses illustrations. And when I hear that most marriages are intimate less, I realize that that can happen in our relationship with God, that we just grow bored or grow different or mad at God or he hasn't fulfilled a promise yet and whatever it might be and then next thing we know we're no longer seeking intimacy. We just, we just hang out out of just tradition or habit. How do we experience God? Oh, there's just so many ways. We can do that through spiritual channels, through prayer, from meditation, worship, scripture, sharing our faith. These are spiritual avenues, but what I want to talk about today, and that's so important, I hope that you continue that, but I, I want to talk about something in my own personal life. How I really feel alive in God. What really makes me sense His presence, His applause, His acceptance. That's a natural channel that I find, that intensifies my awareness with God. I experience the joy and the awareness of God. His presence when I'm taking pictures. When I see God through the lens of my camera, I am overwhelmed. Jim went to the same photography school that I did, Glenn Fishback, but I went a few years earlier. He must be younger than I am. I fell in love with photography. You know, God says in the very beginning, let us make man. I mean, there's that community there. There's a sense of teamwork. Let us make man together in our image. And when I'm out there photographing, I feel like God and I are hooking up to make beautiful images to share with the world. If you have me on Facebook, you've seen some of my images lately. I don't know if you think they're good or not, but I don't care. Because it's my avenue with God. It brings me to a greater awareness of who He is. And why is that important to me? Because at times, you know, I, I think I've read through the Bible, I don't know how many times from cover to cover, and it's real and it's fresh as the Bible says, but there's some times where I just feel like, Lord, boy, I just want something different in my life right now. What is it? I just, I need another experience. And I, I remember at times in my own life personally where I would no longer read the King James, I would read another translation, then another one, then the paraphrase, whatever it might be, just to look at the scriptures differently. Because I'm, I'm given the boredom so easily. I, I really get bored real easy, you know? And so I want to find these avenues that would just fan the flames of my awareness of God, His presence in my life. And I do that when I team with the God created images. I was saved when I was going to photography school. I loved photography. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But for whatever reason, 
I placed it on the altar, gave it to God. I said, God, I won't touch it again. It's not mine, it's yours. You know, it happened in a worldly, you know, time of my life. You know, my pursuit of it wasn't honoring to God. I just, I give it to you. It's, it's yours. As I gave my railroad career to him, my retirement at the railroad, I gave that to him when I was a railroad engineer. Ten years at the railroad, I laid at the altar and went into ministry. Laid it there, gave it to God. And there's other things that we give to God. And we do it out of delight, not grudgingly. I just delighted to give that to God as an offering to myself, to him. And then one day, not too long ago, God says, you know what? I want you to take it back. And I want you to enjoy it now. Many of you, before you knew Christ, you were doing things, maybe playing music for the enemy, for the world and not for Jesus. Maybe you're doing a lot of things that really could be good in themselves, but you were doing it for the wrong reason. Once you give it to God, he sanctifies it. Then you can use it for his glory. I love these people who are making films for Jesus. I think a lot of them are so corny. I can't wait till they get more hip and make better movies. But, but they're, they're redeeming their gifts and their talents and their treasures in unique ways. And they're meeting God in the midst of it. There's a greater awareness of God is, and then they begin to share that with others. And that's what I try to do on Facebook. My awareness of God. I write things about God. I share pictures with thoughts about God. I, I, I want to share God with everyone. I've encountered Him. I've embraced Him. Now I want to embody Him and share it with the world. And what a neat avenue for me just to feel good about who I am, feeling alive I am in God, by just doing something natural. Because it's a talent God gave me. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Jesus gave gifts. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5. He gives gifts unto men. Pastor, props, evangelists, you know, teachers and uh, apostles. God gives gifts. All different kinds of gifts. God gives gifts. He gives natural talents to us that we can use in order to enhance our relationship with Him and bless the world with them also. Spiritual gifts are important. They're for others. The fivefold ministry, those gifts are for the body of Christ and for others. And our natural talents are given to us to bless others. Oh, I just love how God does that. I, I don't know what your passion is, but if you have a passion for something, I cannot believe that God placed it within you for you to use that, to feel alive in God as you begin to exercise those talents. So important. What are you passionate about? You have a love for those things because God has placed it within you. Maybe it's feeding the poor. You know, maybe it's missions. Maybe it's you know, making images like I do, I like to do. You know, who knows? But they can be the most significant avenues in your life. Woman in the first service says, I love to run. I sense God when I run. I like working out. I, I feel like I can pray better when I'm working out. I feel closer to God when I work out. Wonderful. Wonderful. A praying heart always has a praying place. It doesn't have to be in the closet. It doesn't have to be at the altar here. It could be skydiving. Riding my Harley. I've enjoyed God on my Harley at times. I'm just amazed that, that I'm able to feel so free and alive in God riding that thing. There's just so many things out there. You know, it just doesn't all have to be so religious in nature. But it is religious in nature because it's all from God. There's no spiritual and sacred. God doesn't divide it. It's, it's all His. God has human government. He has church government. It all belongs to Him. There's a political arena and there's a spiritual arena. It's all His. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. It's all His. Some people use it for the glory of God, some don't. But us, we can use it for the glory of God. And in the midst of it, have those God, more God encounters. I can't wait to get out of here and go get my camera and pull over and just experience God again as I look through my lenses. It makes me thankful. It makes me aware of God's presence. It begins to change my relationship from something that's so drudgery to something that's so delightful. Yeah? Yes, George. Amen. I want to bring it to a close. I want to hurry. Pastor Aaron, he loves to teach, doesn't he? 
Yeah, you, you really see that, don't you? You know he's having an incredible time when he's teaching. And by the way, if you're here for the first time, I'm, I'm not the pastor. I'm just an old guy, you know. <laughs> just an old guy. He was the one doing worship. Come back next week. But he experiences God, I think, as he studies and as he begins to break open the Word. I mean, you can see it. He, he just loves you and loves God and loves sharing the Word. Your secretary, Donna, been on Facebook lately with her? She just finished a new book. She is enthralled in this new book. She senses God's presence by writing. She has a club here for writers. That's where they experience God, these divine moments, these tickling moments of God. She's experiencing that, and she's using that for the glory of God. It's so neat. The Bible says that God gave the word and blesses the company that published it. We can express that word so differently through film, through dance, through drama through writing, through poetry. We're not just bound by just a church setting. We're free to enjoy God and use what he's given us for the glory of God and bless this world with it. I want to bless this world with great images that move people emotionally. I want to do that. And maybe cause them to reflect on the creator who created all this stuff because he's so good. God's so good. David felt close to God when he took out his old fiddle, if he had a fiddle or if he had a harp. But look at the psalms that we have today. Wow, we! Those are those magic moments he had with God, as Simeon did with Jesus. When he just began to use his talents for the Lord. One of my favorite movies, one of my favorite, 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 favorite. Do you get it? It's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Chariots of Fire. If you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. It was produced in 1981. It's, it's about a, a, a young man. He's a British athlete. It's fact-based on this story. It's not legit, the movie, but yet a lot of it is true. That He runs in the 20, uh, 1924 Olympics. His name is Eric Little. How many remember Eric Little? How many remember that? Few people do. He's a devout Scottish Christian who runs for the glory of God. He was a missionary left the mission field to train for the 24, 1924 Olympics. And one day he accidentally runs on a church night. And in the movie, it's not true, but in the movie his, his sister upbraids him and accuses him of no longer caring for God. He was stepping out of the mold. And he tells her that he intends to return back to the mission field. But he feels divinely inspired when running. I love that. And he felt that if I did not run, it would be a dishonor to God. And he makes this incredible statement that I love, that I love, I love, I love. I believe that God made me for a purpose. He made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Oh. I just melted when I heard that. He made me for a purpose. He made me to run fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. When's the last time you felt God's pleasure? When's the last time? I know you want it again, and maybe there's just something in your life that, that maybe you, like me, left at the altar, and God says, now it's time you can have it back. Maybe it's your sewing machine. You know, maybe it's your your pots and pans. Maybe it's your desire to cook. You know, I mean, when you show up here on a, on a night when us old people are around, what is it called again? Uh, prime timer. See, I'm so old, I don't even remember it again. I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary. I mean, just, you see the gifts of God and, and you can't help but feel God's gift and his love to you through the love in the hands of who prepared that. Extraordinary. Maybe it's serving, maybe it's turning wrenches, maybe it's nursing, riding the motorcycle. I shared in the first service for Shar. I mean, she just sends God's love and her, her, and his delight when she a, is able to function as a mother and a grandmother. And I tell you, my kids are the recipient of that. And so are my grandkids. And so is the Church of Jesus Christ. Because when she watches my grandkids, she gives my son, who's a pastor, an opportunity to rekindle his love with God and rekindle his love with his wife when they get away. 
just to be by themselves. You're so extraordinary. You don't even know the effect that you have on the kingdom of God by the little things you do. The cup of cold water. Little food that you share. Supporting a missionary or giving money in the offering. Jesus said in chapter 25 of Matthew that he will separate the sheep from the goats. There will be a great divide there. And people come and stand before him and he talks about when you've done it to the least of the brethren, you've done it unto me. And the question was, Lord, when do we do it unto you? He says, when you give a cold drink of water to someone, you've done it unto me. When you fed the poor, you've done it unto me. When you forgive others, you've done it unto me. When you used who you were for the betterment of man, you've done it unto me. That's extraordinary. You're extraordinary. And your God is extraordinary. Don't take what God has given you and think it's no big deal. It is a big deal to the kingdom. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened up. And the dove landed upon his head, at least a symbol of a dove. Then what did Jesus do from there out? When heaven was opened up, the dove upon him, he just went out and passed out heaven. And that's what God has asked us to do. To pass out heaven. A hug to someone who's in need of a hug. You've done it under Jesus. A handshake. A thank you at the restaurant. An extra tip. You've done it under Jesus. That's true religion to me. I love worshiping. I love coming. I love teaching. But I tell you, He's come for us to bless the world that He created because He loves humanity. He beheld Christ. He embraced Christ. That he embodied Christ. And he shared them with the world. What is in your hands that you can use for the kingdom? That will jack you up again for Jesus. What has he given you? What talents can you use again? What are the things that will help you be captivated by God again? Maybe Jim and I will teach some photography classes here. Maybe that would jack you up and... You just kind of sense what God is doing. He is an incredible photographer. What do you want for this year? This new year? I hope more intimacy with God. More divine moments. More of awareness of His love for you. And your love for Him. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus said that the kingdom of God does not come with observation, but the kingdom of God is within. It's something that you do in our hearts. It's here. It's alive. And Lord, you want us to share that kingdom with those we come in contact with. I pray for those who feel inferior today. Maybe they're not feeling they're worthy enough to be in the pulpit. Lord, I know that I'm not. Maybe they feel they don't have much to offer. But I think of Dorcas in the New Testament. The first woman, I believe, that was resurrected by the apostles was a woman who all she had was a needle. And she dedicated it to you. And they mourned when she passed. They were so touched by her love and her willingness to clothe them with garments. Lord, they're just little things that you've given us. They're little in our sight, but they're big in yours because you've given us to bless your humanity. A humanity that you loved and died for in hopes that they would be captivated by your grace. As Pastor Aaron says, let us not just love in word only, but in deed and truth. May we take the giftings you've given us. And make this world a better place, I pray. Maybe our hope for the rapture will, will just be set aside for a moment. Not that we ignore it. But Lord, that we'll do everything we can to make sure that others will be able to be a part of that incredible experience when it does happen. Bless your people now, I pray. Capture our hearts. Draw us that we might run after you again. Awaken within us this desire for you like, like we had when we first said yes to you, I pray. Baptize us afresh in your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just come. Invite the Holy Spirit to come in your life afresh. He's there, but just as a form of surrender. Just tell him in your own words, Holy Spirit, fill me again. 
Fill me with the joy of God's salvation. Fill me with the power to live a life that is honoring to you and blessing humanity. Make my life count again, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, just move in us now, just this moment, as we're just still. Remind us, Lord, that there's nothing, nothing, nothing that we've done that can separate us from your love. Convince us of that again. That you love us so unconditionally. Thank you, Jesus. For those who just feel they're worthless, convince them, Lord, that you would not die for your worthless people. That you die for those who are made in your image and likeness. And because of that, we have dignity. And we deserve the respect of those around us. Let them know that, Lord. For the marriages that are suffering right now, Jesus, I pray that they will recapture their love as they recapture their love for you. They'll go back and do the first works that they did. Those acts of love that they first began to model when they first fell in love. Heal the marriages here right now, Jesus. Heal those who are so depressed and feel so broken, Lord. Do it. Do it, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Have your way in your, our lives now, I pray. In your Son's name, amen. May the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the intimacy of the Holy Spirit be yours as you move into this new year. And the Lord bless you and keep you. And may you sense His affection for you. And may you come to a place that you just can't wait to express it to Him. Whatever forms, whatever expressions that He's blessed you with to share with Him and others. Okay? Go have a good year. Go have a good year. If you need prayer, come on up. If you don't know this incredible Savior, please come up. I'd be honored to pray with you. Alright? Are you happy or did I bum you out? Huh? You're so quiet. You're so quiet. I just want you to keep enjoying God. Because He's good. Do you want me to preach again? Is that why you're staying here? I mean, I've got some more in me.